I want to welcome you here today. My name is uh, Dean Holtgrieve, Joe Holtgrieve. I, I'm the uh, director of the McCormick Office of Personal Development who sponsors these flash forums, and I couldn't be more excited to be welcoming Jim Weatherby today. Uh, Jim joins us as an engineer, as a retired uh, commander of the space shuttle. He's the, uh, you may have read in his bio, he's the only one, the only American to have commanded five spaceflight missions, correct? And in uh, and, and getting to know Jim a little bit over the last uh, two days, I have a better understanding of what that means. Um, to be the commander, I did not realize you basically begins a year before the flight takes off, right? So you have a whole year that you begin preparing to train the team, set the culture for how you're going to work as a team. Uh, and he's done this five times, and it's probably one of the most challenging and demanding tasks that maybe exist is to pilot or to, uh, to command the space shuttle, right? So he's maybe one of the most pre pre uh, preeminent leaders in the country or in the world, um, or in space, right? We have to include <laughs> the universe now. <laughs> uh, uh, but he's also uh, someone who I think uh, his career has really exemplified uh, what the principles that we're really trying to foster here in Northwestern and through the Office of Personal Development, this idea of living in the moment and really being, you know, bringing your best to whatever it is you're doing. I think that's, I think you'll find in the stories that Jim is gonna share with you that that's uh, really a theme that is carried throughout his life. And I think uh, it's something that we all can learn from. So I will not talk anymore. I will turn it over and let him share his stories. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I'm happy to be here. Uh, normally I show pictures. Um, in, in this case, I'll try to illustrate some verbal pictures and tell you some stories. Joe sent me three questions that he wanted me to cover. And I'll do that in the form of, well, first I'll give an introduction and, and kind of the basis of the theory uh, that I want to talk about. And then I'll have several examples and stories to answer those questions. I won't answer them explicitly one by one, but through the course of all the stories, I'll, I'll cover everything. And I'm sure he'll grade me, so I'll make sure I cover all the points that, that he wanted me to cover. Um, so first, in, in the way of an introduction, I was aerospace engineering at Notre Dame. Uh, well, let me back up even further. The only thing I've ever wanted to do since I was 10 years old is to fly in space. And I was very fortunate to have been selected uh, years later to be an astronaut and fulfill that dream. I studied aerospace engineering at Notre Dame, graduated a long time ago in 1974, went to one year of grad school because the Navy was taking too long to process my application. I didn't want to get a real job, so I decided to apply to the US Navy and learn to fly on aircraft carriers. Uh, they eventually, I went to so one year at Cincinnati, also aerospace engineering. Uh, Professor Neil Armstrong was teaching there at the time. I didn't have any courses with him, but I did play basketball with him one time, which was kind of fun. Um, one year of grad school, left six credits short of a master's degree to join the US Navy. He tried to talk me into staying. He realized that he was not convincing me because I had my heart set on flying. And at the end of about 15 minutes, he finally looked at me and said, well, I can see I'm not convincing you, am I? I said, no, sir. And he said, well, good luck. Have fun. I know I did. So I joined the US Navy, learned to fly in aircraft carriers. I did two cruises in the Mediterranean, 345 carrier arrested landings. Normally when somebody asks how many landings have you had, a typical answer might be 345. Which one do you want to hear about? Because they're all different. And they're all kind of burned into our psychological uh, memory banks. Uh, I became a US Navy test pilot, uh, which involved more academics, uh, which were relatively easy because of my undergraduate work. Um, sometimes you may think some people think there's no practical application to what you're studying. I'm here to tell you that almost everything I learned in school, I did have a practical application for later in life. Uh, so I tested airplanes for three years and then applied to NASA, was selected. I worked at NASA for 20 years. I, I was mentioning today I flew in space 
six times for a total of two months, which means that 19 years and 10 months, I'm on the ground doing support work and engineering and going to meetings and, and really having a good time. And you have to like the ground job to uh, be fulfilled as an astronaut because you don't fly that much. Even those of us who fly a whole lot, it's not really that much. Um, I left NASA and uh, spent a couple of years looking for a company I could believe in. I joined the oil and gas industry. I worked for BP. I was hired specifically after a Texas City accident to try to help restore the safety culture. And the company would send me to various places around the world after an accident to try to help restore safety and culture and leadership. That's where I began to really, I, I could have used your course, I think, uh, but that's when I began to do some self-study and learning about how the brain works and decision-making and how managers influence decision-making. Uh, I was the technical editor for the internal BP report on the Gulf spill, uh, so what happened there. So I've been, the only point of all that is I've been intimately involved in the recovery efforts from the Challenger accident, the Colum which was the first launch I ever saw in person, the Columbia accident, which was right after my final mission, the Texas City disaster, oil and gas industry, and the Deepwater Horizon. So I've seen the worst of organizations and decision making. I've seen the worst of leaders. I've also seen the best of leaders and what really makes an organization work well. Um, and then I left and, and now I'm here to talk to you. So this is kind of fun, so thanks for inviting me. Kind of in the theory part, but the. The one part, and I'll hit it again in the summary, what I really want um, to leave you with the impression of is the two most important things, if you want to be successful, now I typically focus on dangerous businesses, any kind of hazardous industries, construction, medical, a aviation, uh, aerospace, uh, anybody who's involved in hazards, physical danger, that's what I deal with. And the two things I want to leave you with that are the most important is you really must um, uh, have a purpose. You must know why you're doing what you're doing. In, in the military, we call it a mission statement. It has to be very clear and well-defined. Um, and you have to prepare. In the military vernacular, we call that training. So the mission statement and the training, or the purpose and the preparation, that's the key to success. Um, too often, as I travel around and talk to companies and observe companies, and have worked in several companies, people at various levels of the organization tend to forget the mission statement of the company. So I was looking at the McCormick School of Engineering mission statement before I came here and, and, and read through that just to make sure I really clearly understood the mission of why the School of Engineering is here and what your goals are, uh, what the school's goals are. Um, and also the vision statement. So the mission is critically important. Never forget the mission when you get out and you go to work in a company. Even if you're doing one small part, you are contributing to the overall mission and always remember what that mission is and how your part plays into that mission. Now if you want to be successful, and no matter how complicated or complex or simple your job is or how dangerous it is, you must prepare. Um, so the training, and, and, and really it's kind of the desire to become the best is what is going to make you successful. It doesn't matter what job you have, it's the lowest level job in the company, or if you're the CEO of the company, you've got to prepare for that. And your whole career, and you're starting right now to prepare yourselves for the future uh, when you leave school, um, from hired to retired in, in a company, it's all preparation for doing the job. So think about um, your purpose and the preparation. The only other thing in the, in the, in the way of, um, uh, I want to keep the introduction short. I'm going to run out of time for stories, I guess. I have 30 minutes here, and we'll do 30 minutes uh, facilitated questions, and then 30 minutes for you to answer or ask questions and, and have a good conversation. Uh, the only other thing that I, that I learned from some behavioral psychologists um, everybody's behavior is shaped by only two things. Um, so all, the sum total of all your previous experiences and your current environment. When I heard that, it was, it was kind of, uh, I thought it was pretty cool that you could, I thought the intent was to be able to predict somebody's behavior by the sum total of all their previous experiences and the current environment. Well, it's not really a predictive tool. You can't really predict people's behavior. 
but it's a really nice way of analyzing or assessing behaviors after the fact. It's a good way to prepare, and it's really powerful if you're a leader of an organization. If, if you're on my team and I am your leader, my job is to help you by giving you, first of all, changing your current environment to allow you to do, do the job really well, but secondly, give you valuable experiences that will help shape your future behavior. And now you're going to make the right decisions, take the right actions, even when I'm not around, because I've given you a new set of experiences and I've shaped your current environment. And that's pretty much the only tool I need as a leader is to help you with your experiences and your environment. So that's kind of the overarching theory. Uh, let me get into, into some stories to try to illustrate uh, some of the things I'm talking about. So when I joined the US Navy, I realized the organization, I had no previous flight experience. I realized the organization was going to give me what I needed to fly on aircraft carriers. They were gonna give me three things, the knowledge, the skills, and the proper attitude. The trainers call it the KSAs. So ground school training, extensive ground school training, you're, you're gaining a lot of knowledge in school now. You're also, different than when I was a student, you're also gaining skills, so you're applying that knowledge. I just took a tour around and, and you're developing the skills to put that knowledge into practice. Knowledge is easy to test for. It's easy to give and it's easy to test for. Skills are a little bit harder to give or to teach. We allow you to practice in a laboratory and build things. A little bit harder to assess. By far the most important of the three, if you're in a dangerous business, is the attitude. Uh, Joe calls it the mindset, the mindset that you have in some of the courses you have. Um, so that's critically important. It's also the most difficult one to assess. If I'm a leader, it's very difficult for me to assess your mindset or your attitude. Uh, the psychologist would tell me not to go down that route, but I disagree. I think you can tell somebody's mental attitude with a couple of minute conversation, uh, certainly a 45 minute interview, working with people uh, flying airplanes, I can very quickly tell the person's attitude. And it is by far, though it's the hardest to measure, assess, it is by far the most powerful predictor of future behavior and success in an organization is your mental attitude and it will help you the greatest. Um, I, when I first started flying, I realized the organization and I were partners in my survival, my success, but I knew they were not going to give me as much as I needed. I held 51% of the corporate vote. They were not going to give me enough ground school, so I did extra study, and they weren't gonna allow me to practice in the simulator enough, so I got extra simulator practice. The way I did that was surreptitiously or sneakily I became friends with the night shift janitor in the building where the simulators were and he would allow me to sneak in at one in the morning and I flew the simulator without the organization knowing it for two weeks before I flew the first time and I had six times as many hours in the sim as my buddies who didn't have any flight experience either. Um, the organization did not really help us with the mental attitude. I had to kind of learn that on my own and, and in I'll share two examples with you of the importance of mental attitude. So I was a 24-year-old uh, ensign in the US Navy flying in aircraft carriers, getting pretty good at it, and my confidence was beginning to outrun my capabilities. You know how you are when you're a 24-year-old male, you think you're the best aviator out there. And I was really good, and it was a particularly dark and scary night, and I was coming down the chute to land, and all the other pilots I could hear on the radio were getting kind of scared. The ship is moving up and down. And I just loved it. I was thinking about my brother back in New York, had a lousy job, who's a golf teaching pro, had a PGA card, but you know, what, I didn't think that was a very cool job. And I had the best job on the planet. And I was in my element doing what I was born to do, to fly. And I realized too late, about the time I crossed the ramp to a hard landing, that confidence is good, but overconfidence can be dangerous. Fortunately, I didn't damage the hardware on the vehicle, but it scared me to death. And as I taxied up and shut down, I could not unstrap from that jet because I realized I did this to myself. I allowed my concentration to waver, and I was thinking about things that did not pertain to operations at that moment, thinking about my brother. And I told myself in those 10 minutes as I sat there, too scared to, to unstrap, 
you did this to yourself, sometimes the hazards are inside your helmet, don't ever let this happen again, develop the proper mental discipline to stay focused when it's required. You can't always stay focused, but when it's required, have the discipline, the proper mindset, the proper attitude to focus and concentrate on, uh, you know, be mindful as, as Joe teaches on the task at hand. Um, I'll stay kind of in chronological order. I'll come back to the next example about attitude here in a second, but another lesson that I learned pretty well, I was responsible, even as a, a, the most junior officer in the air wing, I was given the, the responsibility of planning a mining exercise. So the whole, there's uh, maybe 30 airplanes involved in this mining exercise where our job is to go deliver mines into the harbor somewhere in the Mediterranean. It was near Naples. I don't exactly remember where. And I had to plan, you know, back in those days we didn't have GPS. And so the, the deal was each airplane at a particular time would overfly a certain point over land. It's called an initial point or an IP and hack the navigation system and ensure accuracy and then fly at a very particular speed for a certain number of seconds or minutes in, a, in an exact direction and then pickle the mine off of the airplane and physically drop a real mine. It was not armed, but physically drop it into the harbor. And each airplane had two mines that they would deliver. And all 30 airplanes were to do, you know, the various, they had their own initial points and, the, and their own heading to fly. And my job was to drop, uh, coordinate this whole effort so that the mines were dropped in a very particular pattern, a rectangular pattern in the harbor. And then an instructor from Naples, where headquarters was, US Navy headquarters, would, I'm sorry, in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, would come out and measure the position of the mines, all 60 mines, and we were only allowed to miss two of them. And they had to be within a certain place for the whole entire air wing on the USS John F. Kennedy to be successful. And I was responsible for this as a, as a young ensign. So I had everything planned out. We had a new, com we didn't have computers back then, but there was a computer back in Norfolk that we were able to access. And it would spit out, um, uh, or they created the program, and then I guess we had a, a, some kind of a device on the ship that would calculate. Um, I guess we had a computer then on the ship, and it would calculate the location, latitude, and longitude, and the, and the direction they were supposed to fly in the time and, and, and all this. So I briefed the whole air wing. There's a room about this size, briefed all the pilots, most junior guy in the air wing. It was about an hour before they're gonna start taking off and I get, finished the briefing and one pilot came up to me and he looked at it and he said, you know, it's not really making sense to me. If I hit this point and I fly this heading, I'm not gonna be near the harbor. And I took a look at it and realized everything all of the headings that I was giving was mirror image from true north of where it should have been. So for example, if I wanted one guy to fly 030, his heading said 330. And if the other one was 040, this guy's heading said 320. So it was exactly mirror image from north. And I thought, so, so they're getting ready to climb up to the flight deck and start getting in the airplanes and, and, and launch. And I'm gonna fail the whole entire air wing. And I thought to myself very quickly, and this is the first days of uh, computers. Well, the person who generated this program is in the Western Hemisphere in Norfolk, Virginia. So they probably had the Western longitude as plus signs. And here I was in the Eastern Hemisphere. And so maybe if I type in a minus sign for the longitude, it'll flip everything around. And, and sure enough, that was the answer. So I qu quickly went to the computer and that printed uh, you know, 30 different pilots' directions, and I cut them real quick as fast as I could. It took about 15 minutes, and then I started running around to the different ready rooms. And after the fact, giving the pilots, you know, I had all their names on it. I said, here's the new plan. And 29 of them accepted the plan and said, okay, great, thanks, and took it. By the time I got to the 30th pilot, you know, I'm just running around. You talk about moments of intense uncertainty. This is an hour's worth of moments of intense uncertainty. I finally get to the last pilot. By the time I got to him, he had already started his engine. He had already taxied up to the catapult. And he's about five minutes away from launching, just sitting there waiting for the clock. 
I handed it to him. He takes a look at it, and he looks at me, and he says, I believed you before. Why should I believe you now? And I said, please, just trust me. Just take it and fly this. He was the only one of the 30 that did not pickle at the right time. I think he forgot to arm. Um, but the other 29 dropped successfully, and it all worked. But I thought after the last airplane thundered off the flight deck, my first thought was, man, if I passed that test of a, I didn't know what it was called, the moment of intense uncertainty, if this works, there's nothing in the world that's going to ever cause me to worry. You know, if I could manage that kind of stress. And all I did was I focused on what's the problem, here's a potential solution, it looked right, and then it was a matter of, you know, handing the right slip to the right people. I didn't really think too far ahead. It was only, what is the task right now? And I just broke it down into simple individual tasks. Um, and, and so that worked. Uh, let me jump forward. I get to, I'm really going to run out of time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I applied to NASA uh, after becoming a test pilot. I was fortunate enough to be selected. The first thing I noticed when I joined the NASA group, you know, and here I am looking at, at that time we had about 50 astronauts, and I'm thinking these people are the, you know, the best in all of aviation. And I began to notice something pretty peculiar. Almost all of the astronauts, I shouldn't say almost all, a large percentage of the astronauts were overly concerned about something they could not control. That is, they were concerned about the politics of the office. How do I position myself to get a flight assignment, which was the big carrot. Um, that was the big opportunity, uh, the big reward to fly in space. And some people had the theory that the boss liked softball, so they joined the softball team. And others you know, did various volunteer work just to try to look good in front of the boss. And I thought that was kind of silly. And I found all of the work, there was a library that had all of the workbooks for all the different complicated systems in the space shuttle. And I checked them all out, had a big giant stack of technical manuals, and I just started reading the technical manuals. My theory was if I became the best, if I became the smartest, I practiced in the simulator, and I used to do a similar kind of thing. Anybody who would cancel out of the sim, I would, I would jump in. I became friendly with the scheduler, and she would call me first, knowing that I would um, likely say yes, even if it was a Saturday or a Sunday morning. I'd come in and, and fly the sim. I figured if I became the best, the bosses would have to assign me. And so I never worried about the politics. I just stuck my head in the books and studied. Fortunately, I had a wife who allowed me to study even on the weekends. Um, so that is how I, one of the reasons why I got so many flights, because I just decided I was going to become the best at what I was doing. As I get ready to fly my first flight, so I'd already been assigned, but I'm still five months away from launch, was another moment of intense uncertainty that I learned from. Um, the, the job I had, in addition to training, we had this laboratory that was a big giant simulator that had real flight control computers and real flight software. Every flight, every launch of the space shuttle had different software to some extent. And my job was to test the software for each flight. And we were about a week away from the next flight that was going to launch. I was not on that mission, but I was testing the software that they were going to use in a laboratory called SAILS, Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory. 25 engineers, and you know, the evolution started about 3 in the afternoon, and we were supposed to go till maybe 9 o'clock at night. We had various delays in the simulation various problems that they're working through. And finally, it's about 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm supposed to be doing all of the procedures for the deorbit burn to check the software. And it culminates in the deorbit burn, where you ignite the, the two rockets in the back of the space shuttle, which decelerates us and causes us to reenter at a particular second over a particular point over the Earth. And I was getting behind in my procedures. In fact, I was way behind in my procedures. And the engineers were frustrated from all the problems they had. They were, they were getting pretty upset at me because I was getting behind. And I suddenly realized I had about two minutes to go, and I had a whole lot of checklists to do. And I knew, I knew these folks were really going to be upset if I didn't complete everything in time. 
So I went as quickly as I could through the checklist for a minute and 30, I gave myself a minute and 30 seconds. I needed to reserve the final 30 seconds for the lesson that I'm gonna share with you. So I went through the checklist as fast as I could, got it done, had 30 seconds to go before the burn. And I put the checklist down and I thought to myself, what's the most important thing, or what's the only important things about the deorbit burn? And I cleared my mind of all unnecessary things, and I knew I had to have propellant to the system, so I made sure the valves, you know, understanding how the system works, made sure the valves were open and the switches were in a proper position to feed propellant to the engines. I knew I need to have ignition, so the ignition system was armed and ready to fire and the switches were in the proper position. I knew I had to have proper steering, which means the computers had to have the proper guidance information you quickly, you can see in the display uh, the proper numbers were loaded, and I knew I had to have the proper timing. So, so propellant, ignition, steering, and timing is all that matters, and you can look at that in 15 seconds. And, and then I reserved the final 15 seconds for correcting any errors I had, and the burn was successful, and it worked. I've used that technique every time I take off in an airplane before I take the duty runway, I've already done the checklist, but I might have made a mistake in the checklist. Before I take the duty runway to take off, I check the only things that will kill me in the next one minute, engines, lights, configuration, controls. If I do those things correctly, even if I've made another mistake and introduced a latent error, I'm not gonna die. Nothing bad is going to happen. So I always had an ability to, even in these moments of intense uncertainty, recognize what is really important. Know that ahead of time so that you can quickly concentrate on the important things, not worry about the things that are causing you worry or excess worry, uh, which can debilitate your brain and cause it to come to a screeching halt. Um, the next example I want to share with you where I realized the importance of mental attitude or mindset was when my head hit the pillow the night before my first launch. Now I'm getting ready to climb on top of a rocket, three million pounds of explosive propellant, seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and I have to get a good night's sleep before this event and wake up well rested to be able to do this successfully tomorrow without making mistakes. And it suddenly hit me Two thoughts went through my mind. It suddenly hit me. I've run out of time to get any smarter, and it's too late to quit. You know, I, I often think back to the, there's a Simpsons cartoon episode where Homer's launching into space, and inside of his helmet, which is closed, so you can't hear him, he kind of freaks out as he walks into the launch pad, and he starts screaming inside of his helmet. Funniest thing I've ever seen, because that's the feeling you have. You're kind of freaking, the night before, I was kind of freaking out. And, and you know, another one of these MIUs, I'm thinking, man, how am I gonna deal with this? Mostly being an astronaut is fun, it's exhilarating, it's exciting, best job on the planet, but all of a sudden there's a couple of instances where you go, I think I'm in too deep. How am I gonna deal with this? So I had to figure out how, how am I gonna get my mind right? It took about 10 minutes. I, my, the first thought that occurred to me was, this is the only thing I've ever wanted to do since I was 10 years old helpful but insufficient because I could still die tomorrow and that's not what I wanted to do since I was 10 years old. So I, had, I, I needed something else and it, it took me about 20 minutes of thinking and it finally occurred to me, tomorrow morning when I wake up and I climb on top of this rocket, if bad things start happening, if the, if the laws of physics and engineering combine with the evil gods of death and destruction and bad things starts happening, the vehicle starts coming apart, I'm gonna spend my last seconds of life trying to save in priority order the crew, the vehicle, and the mission. In a sense, I was taking myself out of the equation. Doesn't matter what happens to me. It, if I die, that's okay, but I really am gonna to try to save my crew. They are the most important people in this operation, my crew. If we lose the vehicle and we have to bail out, it, you know, at, at that time, by the time I flew, we had the capability to bail out of the, the vehicle and trash it into the Atlantic Ocean, but I saved the crew, great. If I can save the vehicle, even if we don't get the mission off, even better, and finally, if I can save the mission, even better. So that kind of helped me get a good night's sleep because I realized it doesn't matter what happens to me, and I've used that in so often throughout my life from then on 
and I did get a good night's sleep, and I did wake up, and the next morning, the trick is to just stay in the moment, not think too far into the future. I don't think more than 30 minutes into the future when I'm going to the weather briefing or having the press come in and take photographs or putting the suit on. You think about what you're doing right now and you concentrate and make sure you don't make any mistakes right now. You don't think about the future. By the time you get to the rocket and you strap in, it's the temporal horizon is even closer. And so now you don't think of more than two minutes ahead of time and you're focused on the present. You're going through the checklist, making sure you do everything just right. By the time you're nine minutes from launch, you're such, in such a mindful state of in the present trance that you're only thinking between now and the next 10 seconds. I need to anticipate things. I need a 10 second window of anticipation as I'm climbing uphill to anticipate the energy mode boundaries. Um, there's all kinds of things going through your brain that are pre-programmed and trained. And so you need that 10 seconds but I don't have room in my brain, nor the desire to think about my wife. As much as I love her, the last time I call her is the last time I think about her. And I'm focused on the present, and I'm staying in the here and the now, and I, the, the advantage is you're able to see more, sense more, you see all of the gauges, all of the dials, you're, you're sort of one with the vehicle, and you, you feel the vibrations, and you sense the, the gauges, and you see what the displays are telling you. I, I hear the crew members' voices. I can infer what they're asking or talking about during ascent. And on my cruise, we were not allowed to talk about anything that was not operationally relevant. I made a commitment to them. If they said something, I would think about it and process it and respond if required. So I didn't want to hear anything about, oh, what a view or what a ride or this is great or none of that nonsense. It had to be complete focused effort on the operational task. But it's really kind of a cool feeling to be able to stay in the present. Now, how do you develop that? Years and years of training, 14 years of flying in the, in the, in the Navy. And to so go back to the example where I allowed my mind to wander. So I developed the mental discipline to stay focused, stay in the present, not worry about the past. Um, let me jump down and see uh, which other stories I want to tell, because I am interested in, in our conversation Oh, so here's another important one that I learned. So pretty much my whole life, um, certainly through college and then even into uh, the Navy, I had this conundrum in my brain, this kind of dilemma in my brain. I always, I always felt supremely confident in my ability to control anything. But I also felt like I was the worst controller. When I learned to fly, I felt very confident when I climbed into the airplane and strapped in that I was the best pilot in the squadron. But I simultaneously felt like I was the worst pilot in the squadron. I had this huge self-doubt. And I couldn't reconcile this for a long time. And it, it just seemed kind of weird to me. Um, you know, I, I flew a flight one time with the XO in the back seat. It was the first time we fly night formation. So you're flying, you know, just like the Blue Angels where you're within six feet of the wingtip and it's a really scary night and it's dark and there's no horizon and the airplanes are shaking and, and I'm grabbing the stick, you know, and I'm squeezing the black juice out of it, as they say, and you see the white knuckles underneath my gloves. And, and I just thought I was terrible and, you know, really ham-fisted and moving around. So we came back and we landed, and I sat down for the debrief with the number two senior person in the squadron was in my back seat, the ex executive officer. And I was prepared for him to say, you're out of here, you're terrible, you're gone. And he sat down and he looks at me and he says, great flight, smooth hands on the controls. And at first I thought he was kidding, but he was serious. And he, he wrote, duplicated it in the, in the logbook. He said, great flight, smooth hands, ready for your next flight. And off he went. And I sat there thinking, this is really weird. And I realized a couple things. At, at that moment, I realized that my tolerance for, or my, what do you call it, my limits of my performance were a lot tighter than everyone else's. I, I had real high expectations for myself, and I didn't think I was very good, but relative to other students, I guess I was doing pretty well, and, and I had pretty high grades, but I always had this self-doubt of you know, huge confidence and huge self-doubt. Finally reconciled that the, the, the morning we were launching my second flight, so it was the first time I was commanding a vehicle with a crew, and we had some weather problems. 
And so I didn't think we were going to launch that day. So we're sitting there on our, on our backs, nothing going on. We completed the checklist. We're just waiting for the weather to clear. High, high winds at the, at the landing site. Um, and so, so you're allowed to think about whatever you want to think about. And my first thought was, opposite to what you may have heard, some, ast some of the early astronauts lamented that they're sitting on top of a, a rocket with millions of components all made by the lowest bidder. Well, I had kind of the opposite thought. I thought about the 200,000 people around the country that are pouring their hearts and souls into the space program, really doing a good job, and they're trusting me with flying their vehicle that, that they own. They're letting me borrow it for a week or two. I'm going to do the best I can to give it back to them in good condition. But I drew huge amounts of confidence uh, because I trusted them to do the job. I had met many of them, you know, before you launch, you go shake their hands and you talk to them, you look in their eyes and you see the passion they have. They're not doing it for money, they're doing it because they love the business of putting people into space. So I just had huge amounts of confidence as I'm sitting there. But it also, it suddenly occurred to me, this balance between confidence and self-doubt, or conf uh, later I called it confidence and humility, it's actually a good thing, and that's what's going to keep me alive. The difference is, I know I'm highly trained. I've had the best training on the planet from the best instructors in the world. We are confident. We are the best trained crew. We're ready to do this mission. But am I doing the mission correctly right now as I reach up and push a button or flip a switch or input a control? Is this the right control input, or am I making a mistake? So that healthy, healthy self-doubt is actually a plus. It is, it's an advantage in a dangerous business. You have to be confident, but you have to have the humility to say, I might be doing it wrong. I better check myself one last time and make sure. And so many times throughout my career, I've caught myself just about to make a mistake because I think one last time, is this the right thing to do? And, and you end up, your performance really goes sky high if you can balance confidence with humility. When I travel around to different companies, I see too many executives that have insufficient humility. And I'm sure you know people in your lives who are demonstrating insufficient humility. It, it occurs to me as I'm talking to young students who are getting ready to join the workforce, maybe you're going to have not enough confidence. You're going to be humble and, and recognize your weaknesses and you're not going to have enough confidence. So by all means, try to develop that confidence and remember that you are creating value in a company and if you ask a question because you don't understand it, I guarantee 50% of the office doesn't know how to answer the question that you just asked because you're thinking about things differently. So have the confidence when you get out there that you are contributing to the work and to the mission even in a very small way. It might be a very big question that you're asking that's going to help the organization avoid disaster or create success. So it's good to have that balance between confidence and humility, and it's, and it's actually a desirable trait, and you can have them simultaneously, I guess is the point. Um, I, after my sixth mission, the next, the next mission after my sixth was the Columbia accident where the vehicle came apart on re-entry and about six hours after the explosion, which came down over 10,000 square miles of East Texas landscape, uh, my role, I was pretty senior in the organization. I had had some executive experience at NASA, some management experience. I was the director of flicker operations, so I had all the astronauts working for me. I had flown two more missions. Um, I was the deputy director of the Johnson Space Center, so 16,000 people working for my boss and me. So I had a lot of experience. Um, I was assigned the responsibility, though the organization never told me, to go find your seven friends and recover them, uh, the human remains of the Columbia crew. The immediate task, all they told me to do was go up to the Lufkin area and report in. So in the three hours, I think what happened was in the three hours of driving up to Lufkin, Texas to report to the senior FBI official who was taking control of the situation per federal regulations, I think while I was gone, they decided that I would be in charge. And so I showed up and I reported to the senior FBI agent, the special agent, and I said, hi, I'm Jim Weatherby from the crew office. How can I help? And he looked at me and he said, what's your plan? 
And I thought he didn't understand what I said. I said, no, I'm from the astronaut office down in Houston. I'm here to help. How can I help? I had my blue flight suit on. And he looked at me. He probably thought I was some kind of an idiot. He repeated. He said, what's your plan? And I realized at that moment that I was responsible to find this, the human remains of the seven crew members. Fortunately, I had had, uh, at this point in my career, I had had uh, maybe 27 years worth of military experience, US, uh, NASA experience. I've watched how they responded after the Challenger accident. I was working with the executives. I saw good leaders, bad leaders. I learned from every one of them, even the bad ones, what not to do. And it was simply a matter of doing what I was trained to do and applying all the lessons that I had learned. We created a mission statement. I created a mission statement. We covered the crew with dignity, honor, and reverence. And every word meant something. And we communicated that to the workforce. I had 2,000 people working for me, unlimited budget, no rules. Go find your seven friends. And uh, you know, talk about three days in a row of moments of intense, uh, con um, continuous, long duration exposure, uncertainty for 23 hours a day. We'd sleep three hours a night, get up the next day and work, or sorry, 21 hours, can't add, right? 21 hours the second day and 21 hours the third day before we finally had the mechanism in place to go do the search. Um, there's so many lessons I could tell you from that event. Uh, let me just say that um, I have huge faith in humanity. I mean, we saw it in the, in the Texas after the hurricane recently, all the people that came together because they understood the mission was greater than themselves. Um, so I had some great people working for me, and we did find the, uh, the human remains of the Columbia crew, and we recovered them. Um, I think I'll skip the rest of them. They're kind of minor stories, and I've said what I really wanted to say. And I'd love to have a conversation with Professor Joe, and then we'll have some Q&A. As he's coming up, just to summarize, remember, if you want to be able to deal with moments of intense uncertainty, train your brain. Learn how to deal with those moments. And it's all about the knowledge, so understand how your brain works, the skill, put it into practice, seek out moments of uncertainty. Embrace them. Yeah, it's stressful, but that's how you learn. And find those when you get into a company. You know, volunteer for something that is a little tough, that you don't really know how you're going to solve it. Um, it and it, 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 there's a couple of advantages. And also stay in the moment and focus on the job and try to become the best at it. Learn to stay in the moment mentally. Uh, the advantages are multifold, I think. Um, you'll be much more successful if you can deal with progressively increasing stress throughout your career and suddenly you'll find you're doing some massive thing with huge amounts of stress, but you'll know how to deal with it because you've had all these other slightly stressful situations through your life and you've dealt with them and you've built up the confidence to deal with them and you've learned how your brain works and you do all the things that, that Joe can teach you. Stay in the moment. Don't think too far ahead. Experience life. It also makes you feel like your life is more fulfilled and longer. So I'm, I'm confident when I hit my deathbed, I'm not going to say, well, where did the time go? Because I try to stay in the moment all the time, and my life seems pretty long because I've had an awful lot of experiences. Embrace self-doubt. Enjoy the stress of stressful moments. It can actually fuel your productivity and your success. Uh, I guess that's it for a summary. That's, those are some great lessons, uh, and it, got, it makes me um, think of the, the fact that you told me, you know, oftentimes it can feel like there's not enough time to prepare, right. uh, and so we end up feeling rushed, or we end up feeling like we have to, and I, I thought it was really fascinating, the, the, you sharing the story about your, your manager who was perceived to be one of the more, yeah. you know, kind of cautious people, but he actually, in throughout his career, had the highest uh, flight, flight rate. rate. Yeah. So in the space business, you know, most people are really excited about launching people into space, and and you know, we know we have a kind of a 
self-accepted human mandate to explore space and everybody's trying to get there and it's a go mentality and, and in, the, in the launch control center, I've seen this on seven flows of other crews launching or not launching. When there's a launch scrub, because there's a problem, there's an audible groan throughout the room. There's 100 people in the room and you hear, ah, they're all dejected. And as a crew member, I've, I've been very fortunate in all six of my flights, I've only had one where we strapped in and had to unstrap. So I had a pretty good success rate. And, and the press, you know, you come out uh, of the debrief and, and, you know, still wearing a suit and the microphone's in front of your face and the camera lights go on and, and they ask sympathetically the journalists, you know, they have good intentions, weren't you dejected? And inside my brain, I'm thinking, man, why would I want to launch on a broken rocket? I was not dejected. I'm glad we made the decision to not launch. So I learned that as an operator, as a flight crew member. So then when I was a manager responsible for making decisions, I was working for a boss who ran all of human spaceflight. George Abbey was his name. And he had a reputation for being very conservative. And if the engineer came and said, we're ready to launch, he would question the engineer, are you sure we're ready? And he would ask other questions that, you know, demonstrate to me that we're really ready. And often he would not pick a launch date because we weren't ready. And we would launch maybe next Saturday instead of this Tuesday. And it looked like he was kind of slow and methodical and very conservative. I've seen other leaders who were the opposite, go, go, go. And a hydraulics engineer comes in and asks for a delay because I have to do one more inspection. And the boss says, well, tell me why we have to do one more inspection and belittling people. And so then the flight rate, you know, they make decisions to launch and launch. But after a long career of looking at the whole entire space shuttle program, and you can see the various managers, my manager, who was very slow and conservative, had the highest and the fastest flight rate because he was doing things correctly. He was solving problems. We were fixing things early. So when we got to the launch pad ready to go, we didn't have launch scrubs and we got the vehicle off. We didn't have accidents. And everybody else that was push, 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 go, 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 they'd have minor problems. You'd have a scrub, you'd lose two days here. Or maybe you'd have an accident and you'd lose two years of not flying. And it's, it's kind of exactly the opposite of what your intuition might tell you. And we had a mantra, the final thing, we had a mantra up in space, um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And some people call it go slow to go fast. So he, he had a very methodical, very cautious, conservative way of applying the principles of operating excellence. And when you do that, now you can be very aggressive as long as you understand the principles, you'd never violate them and you'll find over a long period, you're the most successful, you have the highest flight rate, you're achieving the most for the company, you know, shareholder price goes up and on and on and on. You know, the way, when you describe that too, it kind of reminds me of, I think it really relates to your question about understand the mission. Uh, because what I think of is when you, when you adopt that mentality that prove to me that we're ready to go, prove to me that you wanna be a doctor you know, prove to me that you, you know, want to go to medical school or you want to be this in, in this program. That's a different mentality than, you know, you've got to do X, Y, and Z or else you're never going to get into medical school. You have to have this GPA. You have to have these experiences. And I think it's, uh, it does remind me, I actually had a conversation once when I was looking at going into a PhD program and the director of the program said, if you want to be accepted to this program, you're going to have to prove something to me. You're going to have to prove to me that you can't do what you want to do without this program, which was an interesting way of thinking. I was like, well, that's a good point. Maybe I don't need this program. Um, and so, you know, but I do think it's an interesting way of changing because it, then it becomes, what's, what's the mission? You know, then you, then you are kind of faced with that question. It's a great way. It's a great way of kind of testing, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. He, he did two other things to me. You know, every two weeks I would have to go to him and explain what was going on in the astronaut office when I, when I was running the whole show. At, at that time I had 150 astronauts working for me. If I went to him and explained some of the success of what was going on in the organization, he'd be kind of losing interest and falling asleep late in the afternoon. And, and, but if I ever told him, here's a problem I have, I don't have a solution, but it's a vulnerability we have, he'd perk up and he'd get all excited, even if I didn't have a solution. So he was empowering me and encouraging me to search for vulnerabilities. And 
that's how you be successful. You know, if you're in the safety department, you're always looking for vulnerabilities. And it's not a pessimistic outlook. It's a, I draw positive energy from looking for vulnerabilities. We, we call it sunshine reports when you're just telling the boss everything's fine. The bosses, some bosses want sunshine reports, but it's, it's not going to help you uh, prevent accidents. And it's not even going to help you achieve the greatest possible success. I think it's also, uh, you know, in, in the engineering school here at Northwestern, we spend a lot of time focusing on design as a way of thinking, as a way of thinking about and framing problems. And we have different mantras that we probably are used to uh, spouting, right? You know, fail early, fail often, embrace failure, uh, fail forward. Uh, and, you know, there's always a little part of me when I hear that that says, why in the heck would I, <laughs> would I want to embrace failure, right? That doesn't make sense. But I think it, it's, uh, you know, another way of, of defining or describing it is that, is that idea of why would I want to fly in a broken rocket, right? <laughs> you know, it's not a failure if it's, oh, you know, we, we've discovered that we need to do more work. We need to understand more things. Or... This didn't work the way we expected it to work, so now we get to know we don't have to go in that direction anymore. Yeah. In a dangerous business, you want to identify failures early and solve them before they cascade into disaster. Uh, something else I thought was really interesting uh, that you were sharing with me earlier and that you kind of talked a little bit about today is this, is this balance between um, confidence and humility. And, uh, and I think you were correct me if I'm uh, paraphrasing this incorrectly, but you were talking about one of the reasons why you were able to command so many flights is that you, you, you trained people well, and then when you got back on, on the ground, you gave everyone else the credit? <laughs> yeah, and the bosses pick up on that. The good, the good leaders pick up on that, and they said, oh, well, we better... You know, first of all, I gave them confidence that the missions we were on were going to be successful because I pushed the crew pretty hard. Um, which, which reminds me of one other thing that I want to close with um, this question. But once you're well trained and the crew performs, they're the ones that get all the credit after you land. So have, have the humility to give other people the credit and you actually go much farther. The opposite of that that I've seen in decision makers or even astronauts is, is the hubris to think that um, you know, we're, we're the ones that are the most important in, in the evolution and, and it just doesn't work. And the decision makers that didn't have the humility to say, so one quick example, Columbia was the one where the big piece came off and hit the leading edge of the wing. And the bosses looked at it and they had the hubris to say, that's not a problem. We know what's going on. Well, they didn't really know what was going on or what, what, you know, what damage had occurred. And they had no data, and, and yet they launched STS-107 anyway, and, and they had a big hole in the wing and didn't even realize it. So don't have hubris when you're making decisions. The good leaders will, will appreciate it if you look at them and say, well, I don't know. And there's so few people that say, I don't know. And I think just to wrap up that that topic, I think is you also I, that was really compelling when you shared the story about being on the on the uh, deck of the aircraft carrier, and you had developed this uh, awareness of your surroundings that you had cultivated, and that you trusted yourself. Can you tell that? So um, I learned. From walking around on the flight deck, well, the, the first thing that was apparent to me that some really good enlisted sailors walk, working on the flight deck, 12-hour shifts every day, they get really good at their jobs, but they get complacent. And it's amazing to me with all the hazards, spinning propellers, jet exhaust waiting to blow you overboard, engine intakes ready to suck you down the engine intake and, and kill you instantly. And you can see in their body language and behaviors that they were not mindful. They were not paying attention. They're thinking of other things. Or the one great example is when they're taxiing an airplane and they're going like this and they're walking backwards right next to a spinning propeller. And, and I was like freaking out when I was a new guy on the aircraft carrier watching all this 
controlled chaos all around me. And so I learned pretty quickly, I predicted that somebody was going to get too close to my engine intake, the A7 the intake was under the nose, and he could very quickly get sucked into the engine. And I didn't want that to happen. So when you start the engine, you're focused on, once they give you the signal to start, you're focused on the engine instruments inside the cockpit, making sure the exhaust gas temperature is good and the fuel flow is okay and the electrics are working and you're, you're waiting, spring-loaded, to take an emergency corrective action if a fire starts or the engine starts to overheat or overspeed, you're ready to take action. So you're focused in the cockpit. But simultaneously, I recognize there's a lot of people walking around and I don't want them getting too close to my engine intake. So I had to, Joe talks about this really cool model of, of the flashlight. Do, do they all know that model? Know. Some have probably heard. So of awareness, it. he could explain it better. Do you wanna? No, no. Oh. So awareness is, is kind of the flashlight, the beam of the flashlight, and you can focus your at attention on something, or you can have a wider beam and see more things. Um, but, but that's your awareness. There's other advantages of that model. But it occurred to me that I simultaneously had to have a focus on the engine instruments, but simultaneously I had to be looking outside, and I knew I wasn't going to have time to make the decision to shut down, so I had developed a mental algorithm, an automatic mental algorithm, of sensing when people were crossing a limit of whatever it was, 10 feet from my, from my intake in an arc around the, the center. But it also depended on the speed that they were going and whether or not they were looking. If, if they were looking and going kind of slow, then I would allow them some slack and they could encroach upon the, the boundary. But if they were walking backwards and going fast, then it was 14 feet instead of 10 feet. And I told myself I would make an immediate decision to shut down. I wouldn't question it, and I would just shut it down. And every time I did it, which was six times in, in a cruise of seven months long, I don't know of any other pilots in the air wing that shut down an engine because somebody got too close. Every one of the six times, the air boss in the tower would start yelling and screaming and berating me because now I you know, screwed up the sequence. They had to restart the engine, get the, the air huffer out there to, to restart, and it screws up the sequence of the launch flow. I didn't care that he was mad because I knew these six people almost went down my intake. Three of the six, after I, you know, I successfully flew a mission for two and a half hours, came back and landed, and they found me after landing and came up and shook my hand and said, thanks a lot, I didn't realize it was that close till I, till I heard the engine spooling down. And so, you know, there's a couple of lessons for me. Sometimes you have to have simultaneous fields of view, narrow and focused and wide to see the emergency coming sideways. And you have to have mental algorithms to be able to make a decision, think about all this stuff ahead of time, and, and make the decision because you know it's the right thing to do, regardless of whether or not the bosses are going to be upset. And trusting yourself, yeah, trusting yeah. yourself to make that decision and then be, be confident with that decision, uh, regardless of maybe the short term. Because I think that's really a lot, of, that, that's a theme that, that I think it really runs through a lot of your, your messages about, um, you know, what's going on in organizations that really aren't acting very uh, uh, yes. you know, ethically or, or, or productively or in, in very safe manner because there's just too much pressure to perform uh, on the, you know, focus on the results. And, and so you really have to have a sense of courage and confidence and trust to say, you know, you're all playing an important part of that organization. And, uh, and, and finding effective ways. I think that's part of what we're trying to train too, is it's not just about, uh, you know, you don't, we don't want you to get fired, <laughs> but we want you to be able to represent yourself in a very difficult situation uh, and, and do it effectively. And the same things that Joe teaches about emotional intelligence and how the brain works, that helps you as an individual, but think about it on a macro scale, it also helps you when you're working in an organization, because the organization is nothing more than a socio-technical system of a bunch of people all needing to have emotional intelligence. And you can see an organization that is becoming complacent. You can see an organization that's going too fast, that doesn't have, that has too much hubris and not enough um, self, organizational self-doubt. And you can jump in and help and, and make some suggestions to some people who are willing to listen. And I have one more question because I think it's really, uh, again, 
uh, a great example of being mindful is, you know, when I've heard uh, a couple people ask you, uh, do you regret no longer being an astronaut? You know, uh, and, and I've, I've appreciated your answer. Do you, you want to? So when people ask me that, well, they also ask sometimes, do you still fly and, and do you regret not being an astronaut anymore? Or do you miss it is the most common question. And, and I always tell them, I remember it fondly, but I don't miss it. You know, I did that. It's the only thing I ever wanted to do in my life. By the way, I had a very specific desire. It wasn't just to fly in space. It was to dock with something in orbit, and I was able to do that. Um, but there's too many other things in the world I want to do. And I, I never looked back. Um, so it was a great career. I loved it. But now I love helping companies. Uh, I really enjoy coming and talking to you. I'm looking forward to questions and answers for the next 30 minutes um, to see if I can help. Um, you know, and you stay in the moment. And this is my life now, and I love it. There's no job I've ever had that I didn't like. I really enjoyed every job I've ever had. And I've tried to do every one of them really well. And I, I, would, I would argue that I think that's probably why you loved every job, because you, you, know, you, you tried to do it well. And you know, so I think, that, I think that oftentimes we can fall into that trap of saying there's this perfect job out there. There's this perfect program. There's this perfect role or title. And, uh, and I've got to get there. But if we instead focus on really enjoying and doing the best of what we're, what, what, you know, the opportunity that's facing us, Ironically, we get typically to where we want to go. Uh, I, I just thought of something else that, along those lines. I was three different years I was on the selection board for astronauts coming in, and I was astounded and shocked and amazed at how easy it was to see that most of the people were in it for personal glory. And it was the rare individual that came in that really wanted to contribute to the mission and didn't care what job he or he or she, he or she had. They were just willing to do anything the organization wanted in support of the mission. Those were the people that we hired, the ones that exuded teamwork and, and the desire to help others. And the good bosses pick up on that. And if you want the best job, don't worry about getting the best job. Do whatever job you have really well. Share information, share knowledge, help others. It almost seems like you're boosting them up, but the good bosses who are the only ones whose opinions I value anyway are recognizing that, and then you end up getting the best elite, highest, you know, the best jobs. And, and I'll, 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 I'll put in a shameless plug for our uh, uh, engineering improv class, because I think another way of describing what you're talking about is reciprocity. Is, is adopting an attitude that, you know, when I'm on a team or when I'm in an organization, if I can focus my attention on making everyone else successful, on making my coworkers, my boss successful, and I think that was, you know, uh, there was a story that you, you, you talked about, you know, kind of shifting your attention away from uh, others and focusing, or on yourself and focusing on others, it's, that's, uh, that's really how you end up creating uh, a really successful, meaningful career, and those are the same skills. It just so it turns out, uh, there are, uh, that you learn when you learn how to do improv. You know, it's about trusting yourself. It's about being in the moment. It's about focusing your attention outward. So, yeah. if you've got room in your schedule, two examples are the, the night before my first launch. When it's not about me, it's about if I need to save the crew, and I do the same thing now when I go and do. Uh, like a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a group in front of 800 people, and months before that it was 2,000 people on, on stuff that I'm, I don't have an academic background, I have no credentials for talking about how the brain works or any of that, and there's a potential to be kind of freaked out before I hit the stage, but I take myself out of the equation. It's not about me. The audience is the most important entity in the room, and my job is to help you with a message that's going to help you in the future. So I could fail spectacularly, does not matter. What matters is what you're taking away from this. And so that's all I focus on is you, the audience. And I, once that's I- Great segue. Audience, so let's, let's focus on the audience. And who has a question? Yeah, here. go ahead. It is being recorded, so we will ask you to, to say the question in, in the mic. 
So when you're in those high stress environments, like when you were running really well on sleep, feeling like three hours of sleep, um, I know you talked about like to manage stress, focusing on other people and like focusing on the mission. Is there anything else, any other techniques you use to like de-stress yourself so you can make the best decisions in the situation? Oh, I'm Peter Hartman. Um, I, I might ask you to repeat the relevant part. I thought you were going in a different direction and I was already not staying in the moment thinking about what I was going to say, but then you went in a different direction. So you want to know if there's something you can do yourself to... I guess just like techniques or to like not stress. I guess how do you separate your emotional stress from the logical decision making okay. you have to make? Okay, so it, it's not an easy answer. Uh, Joe might disagree with me, I don't know. It took me years to develop that ability to, in the Navy we call it compartmentalize. You could be going through bankruptcy or divorce or you know all kinds of emotional issues. When you start the brief for the mission and you walk out to the airplane and you climb in, you're in the moment and you have the ability to not worry about things that you can't control. It takes years of practice and the only way I know to do it is to go back to knowledge, skill, and attitude. So, and, and there's also a precursor that I've learned from Joe. First, you have to be aware of the issue. So you're already aware of the issue because you're asking the question. So now develop the knowledge of how to handle stress. There's a lot of books out there that you can read. But then really important is to develop the skill to be able to compartmentalize and force everything that's unnecessary to the back of your mind for me, it was thinking about the crew, the vehicle, and the mission. I don't care, even if I die. I mean, I literally mean that. I honestly mean that. It does not matter. I was put on this planet to command this mission and, and come back if I can. But if I can save the crew, I'll die happy. And that worked for me. So whatever you can think of, to think about the importance of what you're trying to do, whatever reason you have decided to accept this stress, or maybe there, you didn't accept the stress that just came, whatever works for you, how you'll, you'll know how your brain works the best, but think of a way to repress that into the back. And remember, fear is a good thing because it's a motivator and it will help you prepare. Remember, it's all about the, the mission and the training, the preparation and, uh, and the purpose. Um, but worry is unproductive fear because you're not doing anything about it. You're just wallowing in this self-pity and this worry and, and all this. And you got to get rid of all that. And, and so I, I don't know if that's a helpful answer. Well, and I think, I think that idea of compartmentalizing, I think, is, can be a powerful one uh, in, in the sense that if there's something that you're worrying about or that you're stressed about that you can't control, then it's unproductive to, to ruminate in it. But, but I do, the only thing I would, I would maybe suggest phrasing a little differently is I think it's it is about acknowledging and and then setting aside you know so it's you know the uh, Jim mentioned the flashlight you know the, this idea of attention your attention is like a flashlight it creates a beam of light whatever is illuminated by that light represents your awareness so if you're aware of being stressed out if you're aware of being uh, fearful um, you know but the but where you shine that light is your intention so your intention is being expressed in your attention, which is producing an awareness. So if you can, you know, kind of acknowledge that, that you're stressed, that this is important, or whatever it is that's, you know, that, that is making it stressful, it's important not to just simply repress that or, de or deny it, because then I think it ends up feeding on itself. It's acknowledging it, and if you can, over time, you know, recognize what the intention is that's kind of resulting in that. You know, I like to make a distinction between, you know, wanting to be successful versus fear of failing, and you can think, well, yeah, it's the same thing, right? But if you think about it in terms of where are you going to shine your light, if your intention is not to fail, you're going to be highlighting what are the, you know, what are, what's going to threaten this mission? You know, what's going to be the consequences of failing? You're going to create a very different quality of attention, or awareness, rather, than if you're focusing on success. What do I need to do to be successful? You're going to just be highlighting your, your shining your light in different ways. So I think it's, it's it is something that takes practice, but I think you can just begin with, you know, acknowledging that it's that it's stressful and then redirecting your. I, I try to I try to think about the mission. And when I was we were talking earlier today, 
one of the most stressful things I had to do was go tell the bosses why the organization was dysfunctional. And I knew they were not going to receive it well and I was going to have arguments. But I remembered 20,000 workers who were telling me, you got to keep saying this. So I knew I, I had, my goal was to be their voice. And to me, that gave me the confidence to say, I don't care what the boss says to me. I got all these people telling me that I got to support them. So think of some more important part that's outside yourself, and that helps me to defuse the stress and not worry about it anymore. Hi, my name's Alec Reinke. Um, so I guess in direct connection to what you just said there, um, I was kind of wondering, as much as I, like, I completely agree that you should value those other voices and you should look and protect those people that often don't have that voice, how did you deal with I guess the the bosses in this situation. What when when they did say something to you, right? Like, what? How do you respond to that? How do you stay? Because um, obviously they have some say in your future outcomes in life, and eventually, I mean, the the bad bosses go away. But what do you do to deal with that? In general. Yeah. So my job um, after I had already flown six missions was to help restore the safety culture at the Johnson Space Center. The center director was a, a guy named Jeff Howley, an ex-marine. Big, tall guy, you know, 80 pounds more than I am of solid muscle, big, intimidating guy. And my job was to go in and tell him where his organization was. We had 16,000 people working. It was kind of dysfunctional, and leaders were making the wrong decisions, and it was all coming from the top, and the influencing that they were exerting, and on and on and on. And he disagreed with me. I had 15 minutes with him, and it got, the, the more we argued, the more elevated the tone got. And he was just fuming. I mean, I could see the steam coming out of his ears. And big, intimidating guy, and he's like my ultimate boss, several levels above. And all I could think of in the moment was, I, I'm not going to win this argument anymore. So all I can do for now is to do the following. So this is the general. I kind of get up on the edge of my seat, put the biggest smile on my face, and I said, boss, this is great. Don't just suddenly agree with me because you know I'm right. Let's preserve the disagreement so that we can eventually re achieve a transcendent solution. I said, you want me to be disagreeing with you to help us to a higher plane. And he just started bursting in, in laughter, I think because I used the word transcendent. <laughs> you know, Marines don't normally <laughs> transcend. But all I could think of was, you know, and it's based in reality because the way you the way you make really good decisions is to invite dissenting opinions. And, and I had, you know, had recently studied all kind of the books that are all in your office. And so I knew there's, there's principle, be, there's theory behind that. And I wasn't going to win the argument anyway. So I just said, don't just suddenly, you know, trying to joke about it. Don't just suddenly agree with me. Preserve your disagreement and eventually we'll achieve a transcendent solution. So I think that's a great example of uh, one, I think using humor uh, to kind of help diffuse the situation, but at the same time really make an important point, right? I mean, and really, you know, uh, I think finding a, a, a way of, of interjecting a, a truth that he may or may not be even acknowledging. You know, I think he was probably in this, he was in an in a amygdala hijack, right? <laughs> he was feeling threatened. He wasn't really, you know, probably responding in the most rational way. But it's also, uh, I think, a great idea, or a great example of staying present in the moment. You know, because usually when we're in those types of situations, and particularly if there's a, there's a, there's clearly a power differential, right? We could say, you know, oh my God, I got, I got you know, anything from I got to get out of here as fast as possible. To I'm not giving, you know, this is too important. I'm not giving up. And da -da. instead, pivoting, you know, saying, okay, this isn't working. What is another way I could? I could approach this. And that's not something that, that, you know, that's something that comes with experience and time, and, but it also comes with practice. So you can practice that now when you're arguing with your roommate, you know, or who's going to do the dishes, right? And, and you could think about how can, I, how can I change this? This is a pattern, an argument we've had a million times. All right, what can I do differently? How can I approach this differently to, get, to, to connect? And, and over time, you'll have that as a, as a resource. One aspect of being mindful is the ability to elevate and, and sort of look at the two of you. So I was observing myself and him in this argument, and that's, that's how I prevent the amygdala hijack, is I'm kind of 
overseeing my own responses and, and you know, taking a step back. And, and, and that helps in other areas of operations, too. If you start getting distracted or you're rushed, the two most difficult things to recognize because you're distracted and you're rushed. But if you can have the ability to step back mindfully and just say, how's this situation going? Oh, you're starting to rush, aren't you? And you can practice that and, and, and really help yourself out. Yeah. Just a quick technique that I have used effectively in meetings when I feel like it's, I'm feeling rushed or I'm feeling like the, I, you know, it's not going well, I'll call a timeout. And I literally make the timeout sign. Like, can I call timeout? You know, can we stop for a minute? Can we step back? And let's figure out what, what, what are we talking about again? And sometimes that's a, that's a technique that could give you a little bit of space. Sometimes all you need is just a, a, a little bit of space in order to find a different path. Any other questions? Yeah. Hello, sir. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, what, so you were in charge of a, uh, during the time of the Columbia incident, which was obviously a really big problem. It was like a catastrophic issue. What would you say is like the key to your process of, in that moment of catastrophe, how do you, like, how do you go about damage controlling and how do you get your team yeah. to damage control, like, to function properly under those conditions? Right. So, um, good question, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, when I was asked, uh, what's your plan, I took two seconds to take a deep breath and realize the magnitude of the situation. And then it was a matter of just focusing and bringing all the, the lessons that I'd learned in 17 years of being in the, in the Navy, and, or 27 in the Navy and NASA. What I realized was very quickly that the organization had a contingency action plan Pretty extensive, 100 pages long, and it was worthless. You might as well just throw it in the garbage because we had never anticipated a vehicle that was going to break apart during reentry and rain down over 10,000 square miles of East Texas landscape. Could not use the checklist. You know, the page one of the checklist was things like call the administrator of NASA. I'm not going to call the administrator of NASA when I'm supposed to find seven friends out there in the swamps of Texas in freezing rain. You know, all the stuff that was unnecessary. So I thought back to myself. And, and I had been in many experiences like this, like September 11th, when I watched the leadership team, of which I was a part, transfixed, looking at the TV screen and not taking action. So I thought to myself, I go through a, a it's, I call it a three, two, one checklist. The first three, and then I do two things, and then I do one thing. So the first three are form a command center, you know, an action center, call it whatever you want. Form a, it's generally a room like this or bigger. We use the Lufkin Command Center, a big wide open area where I have line of sight for the head of the EPA, line of sight to the uh, FEMA head, the FBI head. You can drop phone lines in, you set up community, you know, blah, 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 whatever. So form a command center, form a, an organization of people who are going to start doing things in Action Center. The second part of the first three that you do is locate your people and assets. So I was in charge of flight crew operations director. I had 400 people working for me. I had all the airplanes at NASA scattered all over the world. And I had 400 people in various places around the world. Find them. Locate them because they can help. You know, maybe I have somebody up in the Dallas area. Maybe I got somebody here. So locate people and assets. I also want to make sure they're protected. You know, same thing after 9-11, we thought, you know, we were being attacked. Well, where are all my people? I got to protect them. So that's very important. And the third thing is begin to collect in intelligence information. Sense what's going on. When you don't know what's happened, all you know is the vehicle came down. Send people out there, even if you don't know what's going on. Same thing after the Challenger accident. I saw bosses spinning their wheels, doing useless things, and all they had to do was say, Joe, go to that meeting and report back to me. Weatherby, which they did, Weatherby, get in the helicopter and go out to the Atlantic Ocean to the wreckage site and see what was out there. You go do this, you go do that. Send people out, even if you don't have a plan, to start collecting intelligence information to come back to the action center. That's the first three things you do, immediate action right away. Works for any emergency. The next two things you do are 
create positions that you're going to fill with the best people in your organization. So I got somebody who knew ballistics. I got the smartest guy on computers. I said, I want him here as soon as he can get here because we're going to start analyzing the ballistics of the reentry, you know, blah, blah, blah. I needed an air, airborne officer because we had all kinds of airborne search uh, methods that we were going to do. I needed a ground search officer. I created positions, kind of a military model. I was at the top. I had people working for me on the leadership team. I had deployed or distributed leaders who were going to coordinate the plan going out, et cetera. Um, so that's the first of the two things in the second phase, which is, uh, uh, again, it's create positions and then populate it with your best people. And, and the second part of the, the number two phase is begin to develop a plan. So clearly, we wanted to go, we had already started getting intelligence information. You know, there was, I hate to say this, but there's a massive piece of something that looked like it might be significant human remains in somebody's front yard. So clearly, we're going to send a team there first. Um, so begin to develop a plan. And, and the plan is really simple. I mean, you could draw every, every major thing you want to do is going to have four boxes. Um, uh, collect information analyze the information, develop a plan, turn it into actions for people. You're going to go search in this area. You're going to go search in this area. You're going to go search in this area. You're going to fly the airplanes. You're going to have the dog teams that are searching, blah, blah, blah. You execute the plan, but then you get feedback from those people, and you cycle through again. So now you've got more information coming. You analyze it. You refine the plan. You transmit the plan and execute it and collect feedback. You do that same loop over and over and over again. So that's kind of develop the plan, put that in place. And then finally, the one, so I've done the three, I've done the two, and now I do the one. It's real simple. Execute the plan and modify it as required. But when you do that, now there's all kinds of things you have to think about. I have to have a really good communication system because I got a pyramid of people that are working. I'm at the top, and everybody has to be informed and aware. So create a method for communicating, getting the feedback up and down the chain of command. I had to brief everybody that came in. I learned from the FBI, you know, we're going to be seeing some pretty psychologically devastating things out there. And I had astronauts leading the teams that are out in the field. I learned from the FBI. Um, they have a rule that anytime they discharge a firearm, mandatory check-in with a psychologist. And so I instituted the rule that you could not search more than three days in the field without coming in, psychologically decompressing, and checking in with a mandatory check-in with a psychologist. Even if you're too macho to say you need it, you're going to check in with a psychologist. And every one of those big macho guys came back to me later and said, hey, I'm glad you had that rule about, it wasn't my rule, I learned it from the FBI. Everything I've ever done, I've learned from other people. And, um, you know, so there's, there's little things that you do. and, and and would you say uh, it sounded like you also had a very clear mission? Like, did you? Because I would think in, in you know in such a devastating tragedy, and the people obviously were who were involved in the search, some of them had personal relationships with the right people. Right. So a very clear mission statement that every word meant something. So we knew how we were going to recover the uh, human remains with dignity, honor, and reverence, which meant I had to have a, a rabbi or a priest or a minister do ceremonial last rites. I had to have the medical equipment necessary to collect, you know, blah, 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 and transmit. But let me share, you remind me of one other thing. There was another adjunct to the mission statement. I called it the 888 rule. It is just a, a moniker that, you know, whenever you're trying to transmit information to people, you want to develop a lexicon that everybody understands that you can refer to it and refine it and make sure there's good communication. So I created what's called the 888 rule. It was simply stated, the reason is because I have distributed organizations. There's people out in the field, they're going to be making decisions. They don't have time to call me and ask me what's the right thing to do. And I don't have time to call them and tell them you've got to do the right thing. So everybody started with a briefing from me. Everybody in the organization, I briefed. And I called it the 888 rule. And it was, it was simply this, eight days from now, eight weeks from now, eight years from now, we are going to have to live with the consequences of our decisions. So please make the right decisions out there in the field. All I'm really trying to do is to tell them 
make decisions with the highest of integrity. Don't think about the politics, don't think about your boss, don't think about the money, think about safety, doing it right, making the right decision. It was just a, a, a way to infuse integrity into the organization. Now you have a distributed group of folks who understand the mission, they understand your value system, they understand not to take additional risk because I can't go save them. And now you've got a really well-functioning pyramid organization that works very quickly. I can make adjustments. I can receive feedback. They all know what to do. If, if somebody does get injured, they, they'll be doing the right things. That's great. I think we have time for just one more comment. And I, I, I'd love to know, maybe hi, end us on a slightly lighter note, uh, but um, what was your favorite, do you have a favorite moment in space that, that? Uh, yeah, so, you know, there are so many, but there, but there is one that stands out, and that is, I, I just earlier mentioned my really specific goal was to dock with a space station, dock with something in space, and I had the opportunity to do that on my fourth mission flying Atlantis, and we docked with the Russian space station Mir. That night, and you stayed docked for about eight days, and um, that night, I, I learned from the Russians, you, when you're doing any job, you need to take time in the day to stop work, and usually it was the evening meal, and we would socialize and have conversations about family and friends, and anything that was not related to work was the only rule. You couldn't talk about work. And we're sitting there at the evening meal, and all of a sudden they're playing on this really wonderful high def, it was small, but it was high definition video monitor of us in Atlantis coming up and docking with them. So I saw a, a replay of me coming up, and on this really high fidelity, they did things right on me. It, it smelled like an old nasty ship, but I kind of like that. And some things are really cool, like this, like this really good sound system. And they were playing an Elton John song that had no, it was all um, instrumental, there were no lyrics. I don't even remember what song it was. And it, just this wonderful sound and watching ourselves come up and dock with this thing. And I'm just sitting there, you know, I grew up in the era that the Russians were our enemies and we used to hide under our desks when I was in the third grade. And, and here I am working with the Russians on the Russian space station watching myself dock, fulfilling my life's dream. And I mentioned that to the cosmonaut who was sitting there. He goes over and he pulls the tape out of the thing, signs it, you know, stamps it with one of these, you were here, and hands it to me. It's kind of a ceremonial thing. So, so that's my favorite moment, is just being able to fulfill the only thing I've ever wanted to do, and then seeing a replay of it on a Russian space station. It was really cool. That, that is pretty cool. <laughs> and then I, got, I can't end without also you know, mentioning, I don't know if you mentioned it earlier, but you're also quite a, a renowned mu a musician, right? <laughs> you're the fastest drummer in the, <laughs> in the world, yeah, because he had drumsticks with him on one of his missions. But uh, uh, <laughs> I'll let you tell that story. But, and then also, the, uh, I, I thought it was really interesting, your story about, about, uh, ex, uh, about flow, or about the, being in mindfulness flow. on the stage? No, the drum, Max uh, Weinberg. Weinberg and being kind of in that moment. Yeah. 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 Well. Two quick stories about Max Weinberg. I had met him. He came through on a tour before I ever flew the first time. And then he. Everybody, know who, everybody knows who Max Weinberg is? The drummer, drummer for, for Bruce, Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen? E Street Band. You know who Bruce Springsteen is? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so Max is this wonderful guy that um, has developed mindfulness in the musical business. And uh, two quick stories. I gotta tell one other quick one, um, just because I think it's interesting. The I already mentioned the last person I call on launch morning before I put all of that extraneous stuff aside is my wife, Robin. And once I call her and say goodbye, I no longer think about her, uh, you know, and I'm focused and in the moment. I didn't mention the second to last person I ceremonially called was Max Weinberg. <laughs> so on, on one mission, I called him and he was doing sound checks down in Miami and he couldn't pick up the phone. And I was kind of running out of time. I said, oh, well, I guess I won't do that uh, tradition. And I called my wife and talked to her and had a good conversation and hung up. And on my way out the door, I figured, well, I'll just try it one more time. And he answered. 
I said, hey, I got to make this quick. Hey, uh, nice talking to you. Goodbye. I'm, I'm out of here. Hung up. And, well, now I have to call my wife because she has to be the last one. <laughs> I'm going, oh, please answer, please answer, and which she did. So. <laughs> Anyway, Max was telling me one day the, the concept of mindfulness. When he's playing on stage in front of 86,000 people, I stood right behind the horn line on stage in Hyde Park in London one time, and Paul McCartney walked out like 20 feet away from me. It was really cool. And when Max is playing, he doesn't think about the audience. You know, he's thinking about his drumming. A lot of it's on autopilot because he's, you know, and trained over the years, but the majority of his attention is focused on Max the whole time, the boss. They don't call him the boss for nothing. So he's picking up the cues on where Bruce, I said Max, where Bruce wants to take the show. Always got one eye on him, no matter where he is, and no matter what Max is doing, he's always paying attention. He's very mindful of the boss. And I've asked him about making a mistake you make mistakes. Oh, yeah, I make mistakes all the time. You very quickly correct, and you put it out of your mind. Because when it's a half a second in the past, there's nothing more to be done about it. And you're always staying in the present. You don't think too far ahead. I mean, it's exactly the same concept of flying in space. And it's the same concept in anything you do in your future. Your orgo lamp. Keep your eye on the <laughs> mission and the most important thing, and do your job and stay in the moment. Well, thank you, Jim. That's excellent advice. We really appreciate you coming and, and sharing that with us. And as a small token of our appreciation, we want to give you, uh, here, I'll let you pull it out, something that I hope you'll ah. wear. Oh, yeah. Maybe not in space, but maybe uh, on a hike in Bend, Oregon. Yeah, I need this. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks Very again. Cool.